Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. We'd like to thank the sponsor of this month's episode, Molecular Devices. Molecular Devices is one of the world's leading providers of high-performance bioanalytical measurement systems, software, and consumables for life science research and pharmaceutical and biotherapeutic development. Included within a broad product portfolio are platforms for high-throughput screening, genomic and cellular analysis, colony selection, and microplate detection. Researchers are developing a new set of tools for studying previously intractable diseases by differentiating and growing stem cells into 3D organ-like structures called organoids. In this month's episode, we discuss using brain organoids to understand neurological conditions such as autism spectrum disorder. Nikki Spodge from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Sergio Pashka from the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford University and the Oi Thing Su Director of the Stanford Brain Organogenesis Center to learn more. The human brain is incredibly complex and difficult to study at a cellular and molecular level. In the brain, researchers can't easily assess biological readouts of health and disease, such as biomarkers. Therefore, psychiatric diseases are primarily defined behaviorally. Neuroscientist Sergio Pashka became frustrated with the slow pace of neurological disease research and made it his mission to find a better way forward. It's quite easy to see across various branches of medicine that very often therapeutic success is correlated with accessibility to that specific tissue. So, you know, taking cancer as an example, the ability to take a tumor out of a biopsy or after resection and bring it to the lab to be able to see what's wrong with those cells has really accelerated progress in this field. And and unfortunately, we cannot do that for human brain disorders. I often joke that I suffer from an oncology envy syndrome, which is essentially this like very deep frustration that you feel when you see just how fast other branches of medicine have been moving in the last few decades in leveraging the power of molecular biology and just how slow we've been in psychiatry in both understanding disease and finding therapeutics. Pashka began his research career while attending Yuliu Hatsiaganu University of Medicine and Pharmacy in Romania. Research resources were limited. His advisor, Maria Dronka, would often pay for assay kits out of her own pocket. Pashka thought he could make the biggest impact out of his meager reagents by studying what was then thought to be a rare disease, autism spectrum disorder. However, his work focused not in brain cells, but in patient blood samples. We were trying to measure these metabolites in the blood of patients with autism, so I would go in the child psychiatry clinic and try to convince parents to participate in our studies. Uh, I was really expecting to be turned away, but most of the parents would start embracing me and start crying and saying, wow, somebody's finally interested in studying this disease. Seeing some of those parents who are really desperate for answers and seeing how little it was known about autism essentially changed my direction towards neuroscience. And that's how essentially my interest in autism started. I kept thinking that I'm measuring all these things in in blood, but we have no idea how these metabolites and how these metabolic changes are truly happening in the brains of these patients. And so I kept dreaming that there may be a way of actually doing biochemistry and molecular biology in actual human patient-derived samples. Inspired by this finding, Pashka pursued a postdoctoral fellowship position in Ricardo Dolmetsch's lab at Stanford University to work on Timothy syndrome a disease related to autism spectrum disorder. There, Pashka developed the first protocols for differentiating iPSCs into cerebral cortex neurons made from patients with autism spectrum disorder, and he studied the cellular defects of reprogrammed neurons from those with Timothy syndrome. One challenge with this approach was the time it took to grow cortical neurons in tissue culture. Their growth in cell culture mirrors that during brain development in utero. You can imagine that you would need very, very long periods of time to recapitulate later stages of cortical development in a dish. Every few weeks, uh, the cells would start to peel off from that plastic dish and you would have to replate them. And after you would do a few of these replating, uh, the cells would essentially die. I was so frustrated 
with how much we had to play and replay these cultures. And one Saturday morning, I really thought, what if instead of keeping them at the bottom of a dish, we would just use a low attachment plate and just like never bother to plate them down. It was a very simple experiment, just aggregated the pluripotent stem cells in a sphere of cells, moved them to a low attachment plate and just continue the differentiation like that. I, I really thought that they would essentially just disintegrate or, or eventually die. The surprising thing was that not only did they not die, but they actually differentiated quite well. With his wife and research collaborator, neuroscientist Anka Pashka, then a pediatrics resident and now an assistant professor at Stanford University, and his first graduate student, Stephen Sloan, Pashka developed a technique for producing region-specific brain organoids, 3D cultures that self-organize into spheres. Using single-cell RNA sequencing and immunostaining, they confirmed that these cells have the features and functionalities of the actual brain. Brain organoids can be maintained in cell culture for a very long time. Over the past seven years, Pashka's team has differentiated approximately 150 3D cell lines for hundreds of days each. Surprisingly, brain organoid growth mirrors the pattern and pace of brain growth during gestation. After 9 to 10 months in a dish, the organoids look like the corresponding regions in the postnatal brain. With the organoid technique, Pashka gets a never-before-seen look at the brain. Genome-wide association studies have revealed many common gene variants associated with psychiatric disorders, but due to the intractable nature of the brain, scientists have not understood their roles in nervous system development. Pashka can now use this information to gain new insights into disease. One of the great advantage has been in precisely trying to map some of this disease risk onto specific cell types in the human forebrain and specific time points. We've done this very recently uh, for autism spectrum disorders where there are quite a number of high confidence genes identified with this disease risk. And we were able to point towards both a certain type of progenitors as well as certain type of neurons that we think may be susceptible at specific time points in cortical development. During development, complex connections between brain regions form as cells migrate to their final destinations. To study these connections, Pashka's team makes assembloids that are groupings of organoids from different yet interacting brain regions. Using this approach, they modeled the migration of inhibitory GABAergic neurons from the ventral to the dorsal forebrain. These neurons become part of the cerebral cortex and form connections with excitatory neurons. A breakdown in the imbalance of excitation to inhibition associates with brain disorders. For instance, an imbalance towards more excitation or towards less uh, inhibition leads to epilepsy or various forms of imbalance could lead to autism spectrum disorder. It has been hypothesized. And so we wonder whether we could actually recapitulate this process in a dish. So the way we did this is by generating separately both the cortex that has all the excitatory cells and separately we've been generating a ventral forebrain that has all the gabaergic cells. And we differentiate them separately for a couple of months or so. And then at one point, uh, we essentially just put them at the bottom of an epidermal tube and you can just leave them there for about 24, 48 hours and they fuse to each other. And what is remarkable is that once they fuse over the following several weeks, these inhibitory cells start migrating into the cortex slowly and they, they move in a, such a peculiar way. I mean, we've, we had so much fun watching the cells live in the beginning, we'd have these very long lab meetings uh, watching these movies of, of the cells because they don't migrate by crawling on a surface as one would usually imagine, but they actually jump. Watching human neuron migration into the cortex was previously inaccessible to scientists. Visualizing this movement gives insight into not only normal brain development, but also neurodevelopmental diseases such as Timothy syndrome, a severe multi-system disorder that can cause autism spectrum disorder and epilepsy. Using dorsal and ventral forebrain assembloids, Pashka connected inhibitory neuron migration during brain development to neurological disruptions in patients with Timothy syndrome. Calcium signaling through L-type voltage-gated calcium channels is essential for these interneurons to proceed to move. Timothy syndrome is a very rare disease. It's caused by a point mutation in precisely this L-type calcium channel. This mutation is a gain-of-function mutation. 
that means that when a neuron is depolarized, it's excited and these channels open because they are voltage gated, then in the case of uh, channels carrying the patient mutations, they stay open for slightly longer. And so they let more calcium inside the cells. We've shown that because you can actually derive neurons from patients, and then you can look at calcium signaling in the cells. And indeed, when you depolarize them, you can see more calcium inside the cells. But it was not really understood whether this abnormality may give rise to any cellular defects. And so we built four brain assemblies from three patients and three controls. But what we found in the case of patient-derived cells is that they were jumping much more often, which speaks to the gain-of-function mutation. So somehow the gain-of-function mutation in this channel was increasing the probability of them moving. Interestingly, they were moving for shorter distances. And so in the end, if you follow them over 8, 15, 20 hours, they would essentially be left behind. And so it would cause a defect in migration. Pashka's team tried to reverse the migration defect by adding a drug that blocks L-type calcium channels to the cultures. When added to control cells, movement stopped. However, when added to the patient-derived neurons with the gain-of-function mutations, the drug restored normal neuron migratory movement. It would have been very difficult to predict this type of cell or phenotype and this type of rescue unless you would have direct access to the cells in a dish. Sergio and Anka Pashka and their teams recently studied another contributor to autism spectrum disorder, oxygen deprivation in premature infants. Together, they developed the first model for hypoxic encephalopathy of prematurity, a condition characterized by gray and white matter abnormalities, thought to be caused in part by a lack of oxygen in the brain. This condition correlates with poor neurodevelopment that can lead to cognitive and behavioral disorders. The brains of these premature babies are still not ready to control breathing. Their lungs are not mature. So they undergo these repeated episodes of low oxygen or hypoxia. And so we wonder whether the organoids that we've been maintaining uh, that resemble that period of time where extreme premature birth happens could be used to model what happens in, in hypoxic encephalopathy. We've exposed these cultures to low levels of oxygen to see whether we could induce hypoxia. Anka found very interestingly that when you do that, intermediate progenitors, which are this very important progenitor for the expansion of the human cortex, are decreasing after about 48 hours of being in low oxygen. What we found is that this uh, is actually caused by a activation of the unfolded protein response, which causes this intermediate progenitors to prematurely differentiate into neurons and therefore decrease the pool of progenitors and predictably give rise to microcephaly. In an effort to reverse this premature differentiation, the researchers treated their hypoxia-exposed brain organoids with a small molecule that modulates portions of the unfolded protein response. This treatment rescued the cellular damage caused by hypoxia, a finding that could translate into novel therapies for premature babies. Studies of brain organoids are not limited to autism spectrum disorder. There have been recent publications on Zika virus-associated microencephaly, Alzheimer's disease, and brain cancer, just to name a few. Thanks to this innovative technique, researchers have a brand new perspective of the human brain. My dream is still to see that psychiatry is going to be truly transformed by molecular biology to really become molecular psychiatry. I think with the recent technological advances, both in organoids, cell reprogramming, but also CRISPR and all the amazing cellular and microscopy assays that we have today, we are, I think, in a much better position to start making progress in psychiatry than we were, let's say, a decade ago. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Nikki Spotch. And thank you again to Molecular Devices for sponsoring this episode. Please join us next month as we discuss advances in gene therapy. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.